How do you use aliases? Like, where do I start? I've seen this question constantly in our communities and especially in our consulting. So you just got an email aliasing service like Simple Login or Anon Addy, which allow countless alias emails tied to your core email, or maybe you just have several email accounts and you need help finding a system for A, organization, B, better privacy and security, and C, convenience, or lack of. This is an open-ended process and there's no right way of doing it, but today I'll put you on the right track to discover what works best for you. To kick things off, some basics. The more aliases you have, generally the more specific they'll be, with less convenience and more privacy and security. On a similar note, there are very much diminishing returns when comparing the privacy and security benefits to convenience, so your goal is to find the sweet spot for you. This is an individual process. For this video, we are going to assume you have access to unlimited aliases for simplicity's sake. Simple Login has a max of 15 for their free plan, other services have different limitations. Long story short, find the limitations of the service you use and apply that information to this video. This is a mindset video. Let's start with step one. First, you need to understand your digital footprint. This means you have a grasp of the number of accounts you own, what each account is for, and what email it's tied to. If this sounds unrealistic or completely out of your current scope, you need to go watch Go Incognito, at the very least section two, which covers how to get a clean digital footprint. Everybody can do it, including you. Getting this clean slate is important in implementing almost any privacy and security advice as not only do you have a firm understanding of each account you own, but you can use that information to understand how each account plays with others. In addition to understanding the strengths and weaknesses of your digital life, this is even more important when we're talking about aliasing. Typically, the end result of step one I recommend to people is having your entire online life accessible through a trusted password manager. This is an organized, secure, and easy way to understand exactly what accounts you own, in which categories, and what data each account has about you. Once you have this, you're ready to move on to step two. I really don't recommend moving forward if you don't have this done, but do what you want. Step two is categorization. The easiest place to start is analyzing the accounts you own and forming buckets. These can be logical and broad, like school accounts, work accounts, friends and family, bills, health, and the list goes on. You can get a bit more specific, like social media accounts, emails, banks, etc. These can also be a bit more abstract and specific to you, like spam, communication for local businesses, anything you consider an edge case that doesn't fit the normal categories. You should now have a list of at least a few categories to work with. For a large majority of people watching this video, this is probably what you're going to be working with. It is a significant boost to your privacy and security, since each of these accounts will no longer be tied to your core email, and there's a good level of privacy and compartmentalization between categories to avoid companies tying pieces of data together about you. If a breach occurs in the social media department, it's contained within that department and has little to no chance of impacting another category. Each account within the department shares the department's alias email. I'd have at least five categories and implementing all these changes to each account will mean that you've completed step two. Step three is adding in specificity, especially for higher risk accounts. Higher risk is an account you feel collects and shares your information and or is at risk for a breach. Facebook comes to mind, really most social media, or maybe you are doing business with a local company who you know has sketchy practices. These are the accounts you can isolate into their own special single alias. Even though this is more advanced and hurts convenience, I think everybody watching this video has at least one account they wish they didn't need to have for whatever reason, and those are the isolated accounts you would keep inside its own alias. An easy way to find these accounts is by asking, which accounts do I wish I could nuke off this earth, but am unfortunately forced to have due to internal or external forces out of my control? Oh God, why can I never get a break? The world is a cruel place. Word for word. Step four is, well, making everything unique. This is not worth it for most people in my opinion, as it's incredibly inconvenient, unless you use a service like Blur from Abine that automates things inside its own password manager. Full disclosure, I have not used Blur, and I don't necessarily encourage using it, so I cannot confirm that's how it works, but that's my understanding of how it works. Same goes with Apple's aliasing solution, assuming you integrate that with Apple's password manager. If everything's automated, step four is pretty realistic and something you can attempt. 
However, if you're using something like Simple Login or Anon Addy, where you manually generate and import these emails into your password manager, it's going to be a journey, especially if you have a lot of accounts. And frankly, one that leads to the most extreme diminishing returns. Regardless, you should know this is an option. You can make every service its own unique compartment. And the main benefit of this is absolute control. Did you receive spam to an alias? You know exactly who sold your email because only one service has it without a shred of doubt. Were you caught in a breach? You know exactly who was breached and you can recover from even the most disastrous breach instantly by just completely eradicating that alias by just clicking delete. The level of control in step four is untouchable and leaves nothing to the imagination for what could have gone wrong and allows you to respond instantly. And that's really the real win of going these lengths. Those are the four steps. Um, I recommend most people end at step two. Step three has some things that everyone can learn from and step four I would reserve for people who have a solution that works for them or people who just wanna go above and beyond. Now where things get more complex and confusing is when you do throw more core emails at the problem. Uh, if you didn't notice, I was making the assumption so far that you were using the same core email for everything. Maybe it was just a Proton email and you just threw aliases at that. There are, however, some situations where a completely separate email can be beneficial or just required. The first and most obvious is a situation where you're forced to have a second email, typically school or work. You can simply use that email strictly for that side of your life, so school email is only used for school. But you can apply aliasing to the secondary email account as well if you hope to use this email for different things. Perhaps you're a digital media major and your teacher requires you to make a SoundCloud account. Ah, whip out the alias. So you can see how this can get a little bit complex, which is why I lean people to either choose several email accounts and keep aliasing to a bare minimum, or just a few email accounts with lots of aliasing. I personally recommend the latter. My go-to recommendation is one or two email accounts with aliasing applied to each, as it's a very easy to manage configuration with massive improvements for your privacy and security. A couple FAQs I've seen that I would like to address. First, is it okay if I don't want to use an alias email for an impertent serv- Impertent. Impertent? Important service like a bank. The fear here is the aliasing service shuts down or they get breached or the service is temporarily down, which will lock you out from accessing something like your bank. I will say I personally do not alias accounts like banks for these concerns, though the likelihood of actually impacting you are incredibly slim. You have to consider that some people lose complete access to their emails registered to their bank altogether and guess what, they live another day. They go to their branch and let someone know in real life they lost access to the email tied to the bank and yes, this is inconvenient, but it's not the end of the world. So this is a judgment call on your end 100%. It's totally understandable why you might not want to alias some sensitive accounts like your bank. Second. How do I manage phone numbers? This is very similar and requires the same exact philosophy we use for this video. The only difference is phone numbers are much harder to come by. So I recommend limiting yourself to under five categories or numbers, ideally maybe only three. This sounds kind of alarming, but do consider that most likely there are a lot fewer services you own that actually require a phone number compared to an email. For myself, it's like a five to one ratio email to phone number requirement. So if a service doesn't need a phone number, just don't use a phone number. Phone numbers are expensive. Even VOIP services, like virtual phone numbers, like my pseudo, will cost quite a bit when you get more than three numbers. Generally, I recommend having at least your real personal number, of course, a phone number used completely for spam and untrusted services, and a phone number used for all of your legitimate accounts, so these accounts at least don't have your real number. So it's kind of like your secondary real number. The next most likely number you'd set up is if you're perhaps dating or managing a business and want to isolate things into its own number. But yeah, numbers are a little bit trickier. And if you want a video specifically on numbers, let me know, though I do warn you, it's pretty much the same thing as this video, just a little bit more restrictive on what you can do with your categories and phone numbers. And that, my friends, is a general overview of how to handle aliasing. Again, there's no right way to do it, but I hope this puts you on the right track in understanding what's going to work for you. If you're looking for more help and guidance, be it for aliasing or really anything on your privacy and security journey, we have some awesome resources to help you out and make privacy as simple as possible because it doesn't need to be hard. Our Go Incognito course is an extremely thorough journey 
through it. And our Become Anonymous guide is a very action-packed video with a little bit more information. And we do have one-on-one -on -one consulting if you ever wanted some individual assistance. Almost all of our clients so far have asked for help with understanding how to properly alias. So this is something we do work with a lot. And if you did want further, I guess, help with that, you can always let us know. If you liked this video, you know what to do. Make sure to share it around when people in privacy communities ask how to properly alias. And that's really it. I'll see you next time on TechLore.